All right, uh, let's get started. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the chain of trust towards Salsa L3 with Tech Contrasted Artifact. So thanks for joining today. Uh, unfortunately, uh, my colleague Jerope uh, couldn't travel today to the conference, so it will be just me delivering uh, the presentation today. Uh, thanks for joining. Um, I know it's one of the last sessions of the day. Uh, hopefully it will be uh, interesting and exciting. Uh, so my name is Andrea Frittoli. Um, I'm an open source developer advocate, work for IBM. I'm the chair of the TOC for the Continuous Delivery Foundation. That's a sister foundation to the CNCF, and we focus on uh, CI/CD. And I'm also a maintainer of the Tecton project, a member of the governing board there. And Jerope, who couldn't be here uh, today, she's a, a senior software engineer for, at Google, and she's also a Tecton maintainer and member of the governing board. So today we'll start talking about chain of trust in the software development lifecycle con uh, context. I'll introduce uh, Tecton and talk about it. Um, then we'll talk about artifacts for Tecton and have a short demo about it. And finally, we'll discuss what's next and what the future brings in this context. But let's start with a uh, chain of trust. I mean, I probably don't need to speak, uh, spend too many words about software development life cycle as this is the SDLC track. Um, but yeah, when thinking about software and software being produced, we usually start from a producer, which is typically a developer or a team of developers writing the software. As everyone is talking about AI, it could be maybe some AI system contributing to it. And then the software goes through a series of steps. Typically, it's stored in a software um, configuration management system, then goes for a build process, which might bring in a certain number of dependencies. The result is packaged, and then the package is what gets the final consumer. And so a uh, chain of trust in this context, it means that we can put a certain level of trust on every single step in this process that I just, des just described. So in all the processes that we have in our uh, software development life cycle, and uh, each one of them. So at the end, the consumer can trust that what it's consuming, what it's using, either as a dependency or an application, it's actually what was in the intended result by the producer. Uh, but what happens is something goes wrong. It's enough that one uh, part of the chain is broken and then the chain of trust falls. And so this picture is taken from the Salsa specification. I will talk more about Salsa in a moment. Uh, but I like it because it highlights um, the, the threat surface quite well. Um, it, separate, it starts by separating the, the initial diagram in three parts. So we have source part, uh, build phase, and the dependencies on the bottom. And then it identifies threats, so things uh, which could go wrong uh, in the build process in every single part of, of this. For instance, um, if you think about uh, writing software, it could be that someone is impersonating a developer. Maybe a developer does not have a secure account for GitHub or GitLab, and someone manage, manages to get access to the credentials and submit some uh, malicious code on, on their behalf. Or it could be that the, the Git repository itself is compromised. So we, we actually produce the right software, but someone manages to get access to it and introduce malicious software there, um, and so forth. Similarly, in the build phase, the build system itself could be compromised. And this has uh, happened actually um, in the case of the solar wind uh, case, in ca if you have heard about it, where they were producing software, but the build system was compromised. So they were actually, without realizing, building software which was malicious and then used by several of their customers. Then. Even if the build system is fine, the build system will produce artifacts and store them somewhere. And the package registry or where this uh, software is stored may be compromised. 
and so forth. So there you can see that the, the fret surface is quite wide. Today we will focus on the build part of it. Um, all right, I promised I will say, say, say something more about SALSA. So SALSA stands for Supply Chain Levels for Software Artifacts. And it's a security framework. So it's a way, it gives you a framework of reference to describe the level of trust that you have in your build process, basically, or in your entire software development life cycle. SALSA defines uh, three tracks. One is for build, one is for source, and one for dependencies. In fact, the only one that has been implemented by the specification until now is the build one, which is the one that we are looking at today. So how does the framework look like? So for each track, there are several levels. The first level is level zero, means no requirement at all. So every build system out there is SALSA level zero compliant. That's easy enough. In the level one, uh, we introduce a concept of provenance that shows how the package was built. Right? So it means that we must have some document produced by the build system which tells us several information, like which were the inputs to the build system, but also what steps we used. So what um, tasks were ex executed to actually produce the software. And so every build system that produces such provenance information is SALSA level one. In level two, uh, we introduce the concept of hosted build platform, meaning that if you're building the software on your laptop that cannot be a SALSA level two uh, compliant, right? So it needs to be uh, a hosted build platform and the provenance document, uh, so the attestation that we describe in level one must be signed. So we must use uh, a signing system that we trust, uh, of course, and so we, we can have signed provenance and we can build uh, our software in a hosted platform. And finally, the, the third level, the final level is level three, and that requires a hardened build platform, a secure build platform that we can trust, basically. All right. Okay, a few words about Tecton now. Tecton is a cloud native um, open source CI CD system or a tool to build CI CD systems. Um, it's hosted by the CD Foundation, Continuous Delivery Foundation. Um, it's a graduated project there. And it benefits from a, a nice community, large community of contributors, including IBM, Red Hat, Google, CloudBees, and many, many more companies. Uh, there are several adopters, from, uh, ranging from vendors like IBM, CloudBees, Google, Ozone, and Red Hat. And we have a number of end users as well, which some uh, large scale implementations uh, of Tecton, like Newbank and many others. Um, we have a larger list of our adopters. I put the QR code there if you want to get the list, but also if you're a user of Tecton, uh, please uh, submit a pull request to us. We are very keen on knowing our uh, end users. Um, so how does Tecton work? So Tecton is based on Kubernetes and it's basically an extension of Kubernetes. You might be familiar with the concept of custom resource definition. In a nutshell, um, Kubernetes defines a number of resources like pods, deployment and services, but it also allows application to define their own resources that work in a similar way and you can write controllers for them. And so uh, Tecton introduces a few resources to model CI/CD pipelines. So there is a pipeline um, that is kind of the larger resource, or maybe we can start from the inner one. So the, the smaller piece of reusable uh, definition that you have in Tecton is the step, and we call it step action. And if you use Tecton before, you may have not heard of step actions before. This is because it's something that we introduced in one of our latest releases to make steps actually reusable. Uh, a sequence of step definition makes a task, 
and a graph of tasks makes uh, a pipeline. And all these are tacked on resources, which means they can be reused, so you can buy them within an organization on in the open source and share them. Uh, you can sign them, secure them, and distribute them. Um, we work with Artifact Hub, for instance, so you can get tech and resources from there. On the runtime side, um, I talked about pipelines and tasks. We have also other resources that are dedicated to the runtime side. So if you want to run a pipeline in Tecton, you need to create a pipeline run. And then the pipeline run controller will kick in and make sure that the pipeline is actually executed. In terms of Kubernetes resources, um, steps map to containers in Kubernetes. Uh, pods correspond to task runs, so task runs correspond to pod. And we have some uh, magic trick in Tecton to make sure that the different steps so the different containers in the pod are executed sequentially uh, rather than all together, like normally in a pod. And then, um, right, so, and then pipeline runs and task runs include uh, the list of parameters that have been passed. So typically when you start a task run or a pipeline run, you pass some parameters to it and you obtain some results. So parameters are part of the specification and then the results go into the status, like, other Kubernetes resources. And all this information, so the definition of the task and the pipeline, the definition of the runtime site, so the parameters, the results, and, every, and all this information together, then is what you need to actually write a provenance document that is required for Salsa L1 and L2. We have a number of security features already implemented in Tecton. So if you're security minded, uh, I think it's a good option to, to you, for you to look at. Um, as I was mentioning, um, pipeline task, those kind of resources can be signed by the author. And so the Tecton controller has the ability to verify the signature when you um, submit them and refuse to execute anything that is not matching the signature, basically. Another thing, another feature that um, it's almost finished, is about signing the run side. Uh, for that, we are working, we are integrating with PFET, so because on the run side, we actually have a workload running in the uh, Kubernetes cluster. So we want to have a workload identity that we can use to sign the status and the specification of the runtime resources. So um, I mentioned, in the previous slide here, the task runs correspond to pod. Um, so if you have multiple tasks in your pipeline run, what happens is that uh, your task might need to share data across them. Maybe one task produces some amount of data, it clones a repository, and the next task wants to use that. Uh, because pods don't natively share any storage, so we introduced the concept of workspace. A workspace is typically mapped at runtime to something like a PVC in Kubernetes, and it allows tasks to, to share data. And I put a red circle around the workspace because that's kind of the weak part of the chain that we're going to look at today because we don't really know what happens in the, in the workspace. So we know that a task writes something in the workspace and the next task takes out of the workspace, but we don't know what these things are and we don't have a way to verify that what we receive is actually what was produced. Uh, before we get to there, um, I also wanted to mention Tecton Chains. Tec uh, Tecton is actually a collection of projects, and one of them is called is Tecton Chains. Is, it focuses on security. It's again a Kubernetes controller. It watches Tecton runtime resources. And what it does, it basically it's able to detect um, spatial results, which corresponds to artifact being produced. And then it integrates with SIGSTORE to sign those uh, artifacts um, and then produce uh, attestations. We support various formats, including in total. And those attestations can be um, uploaded even in the um, SIGSTORE uh, permanent uh, log. Right. Um, 
I'm going to switch to a quick demo where I wanted to show you um, the case why we are worried about what happens with a workspace. Oh, it's not showing the the other screen somehow. Okay, let me see. All right, I need to move it because it's. Oh, sorry about that. see if I can mirror instead yeah all right okay that's better all right I was saying um, I have a very uh, simple setup um, with um, a producer task and a consumer task. So the producer task writes a simple message on the workspace. The consumer task reads from the workspace the message. And you can imagine that this, instead of being a message, could be an artifact that is going to be embedded in the final artifact delivered to the end user. Right, so. This is the pipeline run definition where it trigger. Let's see if I have something. So you see some YAML at least. Um, which is always good to see. Right, so you can see there is a producer task here, a consumer task, and a workspace that is shared between the two. So this works like every other uh, Kubernetes uh, type of system. So you just cube cuddle, create, and then the, your demo. And we have also a nice CLI. But you can see producer task executed. He wrote, I love open source. I won't try it with the French version. Um, and then the consumer received, I love open source, so everything looks good. So what I could do, I also have a malicious task here. Which is, look, it, it knows somehow where the other task is going to write and it's looking for changes there. So if I run my demo pipeline again and look at the logs, ah, wrong command, sorry. Right. Something different happened this time. So we produced I love open source and we got bonjour instead. But the really worrying thing is that the pipeline run executed correctly. No one knows something wrong happened, so we have no way to detect this. So that means that in this case, this artifact will be produced, chains will pick it up, will sign it with a valid certificate, say actually, yeah, this is stamped, this is good, and it end up maybe as a dependency of a much larger system that will do harm to a very wide surface. Okay, let me switch back to the presentation. Uh, you don't want really to see my notes, I don't need them, so I'll just do like this. Right, so this was a setup of the first part of the demo with the two tasks. And the build system is compromised by an internal attacker. So someone needs to have access to the build system to do something like this. And that's why we started working on Tekton artifacts. And so there are 
couple of phases that we are introducing this. The first part is really step attestation. So I mentioned before that the kind of smaller unit of execution we have is a step. The step is a container. So we are defining a kind of standard format that step can use to write an attestation. So declare what the inputs that they received and the outputs that they're writing. Right. And so, and this can be used then by subsequent steps or tasks to verify that what they received is actually what was produced and what was expected. So at this uh, level we are introducing then the attestation format for steps, also task level attestations which are, which is, which must be a subset of the step attestations because steps might have a combination of actual artifacts and byproducts, so things that are kind of intermediate things that have been produced along the way before we actually get to the final result. And also what we are adding is a mechanism to pick up this attestation files written by the steps and transform them and put them in the status of the, te of the Kubernetes resources, meaning in your task run status or the pipeline run status sorry, no, in the task run status, you will be able to see this provenance information. And this is how we actually make this available then to the next task that is running. And this is, oh, to show some YAML again, this is what it might look like. Um, so as part of the task run, we have status, results, and then we have a list of steps that have been executed. And for each step, we have input and output. And uh, we specify an optional name, a URI where the artifact is, and a digest, or potentially a list of digests. All right, the second phase um, is to actually extend uh, the Tecton API to introduce a concept of artifact in the API itself. This means that uh, tasks and pipeline will be able to define the artifacts that they will consume and that they will produce upfront as part of their specification. So when I'm writing a task, I say actually this task will um, accept a certain, I don't know, a Git repository as an input and it will produce an OCI image. So I can define that upfront. And the fact that we define that upfront um, has certain advantages because it means that the Tecton controller can do uh, some more automatic things for you. Um, it can automatically inject steps that will um, help you um, generate and verify the provenance, which we cannot do if we don't know upfront uh, what is, uh, a certain task is going to do. Also, we um, envision that uh, we'll have um, user provide steps because y you might want to, um, sorry, you might want to um, upload your artifact or store your artifact in, in, the sto in your storage of choice. So it could be today we use PVC for within the pipeline, but you might, might actually want to store artifacts in an object store, in an OCI registry, or some other kind of registry that you, uh, system, storage system that you have internally that you prefer. So, um, the other reason uh, we, are produce, we are introducing this feature in Tecton is to improve the generation uh, of attestation that we do today. I briefly mentioned earlier that today Tecton Chains relies on special kind of results that Tecton produces to identify um, artifacts. So we want artifacts to actually be a first class resource in Tecton so that chains can do a much better job in identifying different type of artifacts and sign them for you and produce attestation that includes um, all the different steps that were executed and the different artifacts, intermediate artifacts that were produced before the final one. Um, and this allows us to align better with uh, the in total specification for attestation and something else um, that we want to, to do is that um, Tecton today can produce events. 
that tell you what is happening in your pipeline run, if pipeline are starting, stopping, and so forth. And you can collect these events to have kind of an audit trail of what is going on, what, is, what happened in your pipeline. Or you can also use these events to trigger logic. Uh, for instance, if you want to start a new pipeline uh, when the previous one is finished. Uh, but because we don't have a concept of artifact yet, or we didn't have a concept of artifact yet, uh, we couldn't send events specific to artifacts. Um, there is a specification uh, within the CD foundation called CD events, which uh, defines um, a standard for events format in the CI CD space. And CD events include artifacts, uh, events specific to artifacts. So CD events community is working with different tools uh, in the CI CD space, including artifact registries to support this kind of events. And we want Tecton to be able to produce artifacts events as well. So whenever an artifact is produced by Tecton, we can send an event and you can store this event in your event store, um, again, for audit trail purposes, or you can trigger logic based on that. Okay, let's switch to the second part of the demo. So the setup is a bit more uh, complicated this time. We still have our producer and consumer task, but we have additional steps that are being executed. So the producer, uh, on the producer side, we produce our content in the local storage for the pod, and then we have steps that hash that content and then upload it to the workspace. On the receiving side, before we actually consume the content, we have additional steps that download locally the content that was stored in the workspace and verify uh, that the hash that was produced on the producing side uh, matches. So it recalculates the hash and verifies that it matches. So we use the status of the resources um, to store the provenance information so the consumer side can take the expected hash from the status and verify with the hash that has been calculated. Oops. Show. Okay, so our evil attacker is still running here. Uh, but this time I will run a different pipeline. Sorry, let's Look at the which is this one where we use the artifact producer and artifact consumer. So these are announced version of the same task. As I was mentioning, this task additionally have, have um, the steps to calculate the SHAs and verify the SHAs. So you can see uh, the producer is doing the same thing as before. Um, but additionally, it's displaying this information with the SHA of the artifact that was produced, our message in, in, in this case. And the consumer fails this time, right? Because it verifies, it expected this SHA, which is the one that was produced by the producer, but it computed the SHA locally again. And because the message was hacked, now the SHA doesn't match anymore, so the consumer can be aware that this um, has been tampered with. So, um, so what's next? So we are working on implementing this feature on Tecton side. And I was uh, mentioned earlier, um, we expect to have steps that can do this work of uploading, downloading artifacts, verifying, computing and verifying the SHAs, hopefully contributed um, by Tecton users as well, as there may be many different type of ta uh, artifacts and each type of artifacts may have its own 
uh, SHA algorithm that is used to calculate. And so hopefully we'll be able to build a, a catalog of reusable steps that the community can benefit from. We're working on extending the concept of artifacts from task to pipeline. And then there are uh, features like um, hermetic execution that we started working on uh, before but we had the problem of knowing okay when can we cut network access and restore it and with the um, definition of artifacts we, we have a, a clear um, definition of what is inputs that are coming into the pipeline and what are output that needs, output that needs to be uh, pushed to some external system so with what we can do when enabling hermetic execution we can make sure that all the input artifacts are available locally, run or built without network access, making sure that no unwanted dependencies are brought in, and then resume for the production of artifacts. I mentioned already support of related standards like SPIFE, Intoto, and CD events. Other things that the community has been working on. Um, things like machine learning model transparency. So the team uh, on Google side especially um, has been looking at using this kind of technology to produce attestation uh, for machine learning models. So you can imagine using Tecton pipelines for building, uh, for running machine learning type of pipelines. And you can do this natively uh, directly in Tecton or you can do it through tools like Kubeflow so this is supported today. Um, in Kubeflow you can define your pipelines um, in Python format and then they can compile to different languages and supported today is Argo workflow and Tecton. So you can define them in a language that is familiar with uh, data scientists and then execute them in Tecton. And this uh, type of functionality uh, with artifacts and uh, provenance will allow to have more transparency in how the models were produced by your pipeline because you can see step by step what was produced um, by the pipeline. Another functionality that we are looking forward to uh, implement out of this is res resumable pipelines because today we kind of miss the exact state in between tasks. It's hard to implement resumable pipelines but especially when you start looking at data pipelines that may be very expensive from a computational point of view. It makes sense if a pipeline was interrupted at some point in time to be able to resume the execution so that you don't have to recompute everything that was done already. And having uh, a track of all the artifact, intermediate artifact within a pipeline will uh, enable us to do that. Okay. Thanks. All right, just to conclude, um, we are implementing this feature uh, with Tecton Artifacts and we'll soon have the first release uh, with the first phase implemented. And so we are looking for input and feedback from the community of course. So if you uh, are looking at the chain of trust in your build system today and you have specific use cases or problems that you want to address, feel free to reach out to us on the Tecton Slack or let us know. I put here uh, a QR code with a link to the design that we are using. So we use a mechanism called TEP, TEP Tecton Denouncement Proposal, similar to the Kubernetes one, uh, to the CAPS. So if you have feedback to that, that would be uh, very welcome. And just in a nutshell, uh, to summarize, uh, SALSA defines guidelines for supply chain security with multiple levels. Today we focus on level three for build, which focuses on uh, avoid tampering during the build. And for that, um, we look at that in the Tecton, which is a powerful CICD framework, which already implements many SALSA related features. Um, and we introduced Tecton artifacts to extend the existing salsa features to bring Tecton towards the level three requirements for build and also introduce better provenance generation. Okay, I hope this was uh, useful to you. Thanks again for attending and we might have one minute left for, for questions if you have any.
Oh, and the QR code is a link to the slides. They are in, in, in SCAD, anyways. Oh. I thank you very much for this presentation. I did not know much about uh, Tecton, but uh, now I'm interested in. Uh, just quickly, could you tell me if uh, I can improve with Tecton my current uh, Go releaser pipeline, which is uh, currently running either on GitHub and GitLab because I uh, tested both of them. So I'm already computing as bombs with the Go release of framework. I'm also relying on Cosine to sign it, but mm -hmm. I'm yet to introduce uh, attestation. So can Tecton help me? Uh, does it work on GitLab and GitHub? Do I need uh, custom runners? Right. Um, that's a great question. So Tecton is, is very popular for um, organizations and companies that build their internal um, kind of platform, if you, if you will, the system, uh, because of this reusability and scalability features. We started working on a GitHub um, action to make it uh, easier to ramp up with like GitHub integration. But yeah, right now it still needs some you know, extra work and scaffolding to, to bring it up. So you, you don't have like a click and run Tecton for, for GitHub. If you have everything in place, you don't have to you know, switch to another system if everything that works for you. But on Tecton side, if you're building a larger system, we have a very uh, strong focus on security features, being security minded. So if that's something that is interesting and you want to build to have a system that allows you to scale uh, for large teams, many, many pipeline execution, that might be something to look into. So a uh, question over here. Yeah. Um, so when you're generating attestations for something like an ML pipeline, um, uh, that process is going to be non-deterministic. If you were to go and train a model or do something else like this again, you'd get a different result. So what can you actually use the attestation for? Right. Um, <laughs> that's a great question. Um, I'll be honest, I didn't work on that part. That was mostly the, the Google team uh, that worked on, that started looking at that. Um, uh, so, um, yeah, I don't have a great answer for that, but I will relay your question. Oh, there's one more question. Um. Oh. Hi. Um, Hi. Yeah, so about the workspaces, you, you uh, I, I, if I followed correctly, you had two task runs side by side, and um, one of the task runs was interfering with information in the workspace, um, and then like messing with the other task run, is that right? Yeah, that's um, right. I guess this only works in a situation where your workspace is declared as like a PVC type, like if it's an empty DIR type, and therefore the workspace is isolated to that single task run alone, it's not accessible by the other task run, is that right? Th that's right. The only thing is that when you use MTD, we use MTD a lot like local storage for the task, but then it's hard to make it available to other tasks. So if you have a, a following task consuming that, uh, you need to have some kind of shared storage. It can be a PVC or it can be, you know, you can have a local object storage that you set up where you share things. But in any case, you might still have an attacker that is gained access to, to that kind of shared storage. So the yeah. key thing is to be able to, to use a different channel, like the status, to share the expected SHA so that you can verify on, on the receiving side. Okay. But if, if the PVC or the workspace was like specific just to that task run and I was like vending a new PVC for every task run, that would be fine, right? That would resolve the problem. But I guess there's issues with requesting a PVC like for a task run as it might introduce latency. Um, yeah, but even if you had a, a PVC dedicated to every task, or I mean, you still wouldn't be able to share data across the different tasks because. Oh, so I, I meant like a workspace in a PVC per task run. Um, okay. Or like for that single pipeline, but yeah. But yeah, yeah. So you can, 
you can secure it as much as possible. You can do tricks to, to try to secure the specific of the storage system that you use, for sure. So that, that's a, a great point and a question also I've had on this. But I think um, having the ability to verify, um, it's really useful and it's also helpful for, for the provenance information because then you get this intermediate uh, shards. All right. I think we are at time, sorry. But thanks again.